Today we're looking across the globe at the largest offshore wind farm in the world, Dogger Bank. It's an under construction array of turbines that will eventually produce enough electricity to power more than 5% of the UK's demand. This ambitious project is setting the groundwork for offshore wind all across the globe, introducing new technologies and methods at an unmatched scale. And this has come with numerous challenges, and we'll talk about the most important ones. Whether you know a lot about how these farms work or are just being introduced, you're going to want to stick around because this one will be well worth the watch. Off the coast of Yorkshire, the Dogger Bank Development Zone is located between 81 and 124 miles, or 125 and 290 kilometers, and extends over approximately 8,600 square kilometers, with water depths ranging from 18 meters, or 59 feet, to 63 meters, or 207 feet. Many thousands of years ago, it's theorized that the UK was connected to the rest of mainland Europe. This in-between connecting area was known as Doggerland, hence giving the project its name, Dogger Bank. The development the development area covers waters owned by the UK, Germany, Netherlands, and Denmark. And this is an attractive location for offshore wind farms because it's far away from the shore, avoiding complaints about the visual impact, yet the water depth is shallow enough for traditional fixed foundation wind turbine designs. While recent technology has allowed a new type of floating turbine, they're too expensive and unreliable at this point to be worth pursuing for this project. The area is subdivided into smaller sections, called Dogger Bank A, B, and C. Each of these sections have a generation capacity of 1.2 gigawatts, with the total amounting to 3.6 gigawatts, or as mentioned, approximately 5% of the UK's demand. Dogger Banks A and B will connect via undersea cables in the existing Creekbeck substation near Cottingham. Dogger Bank C will connect at the Lacken B substation at Teesside. There have also been plans developed for more of these same type of wind farms in this same area, but more on that later. Constructing this massive project is a marvel of its own. The turbines utilized in this project are from the GE Haliad family, with everything from 13 to 14 megawatts. This means that nameplate generation, just one of these can power just under 20,000 homes. In other words, one single rotation of these blades can power the average home for up to two days. But in order to produce this amount of power, the turbines have to be massive. These giants are up to 853 feet or 260 meters tall, meaning there are only two 200 feet shorter than the Eiffel Tower. In addition, the blades have a diameter of 722 feet or 220 meters. It's really impossible to get a true feeling for how massive these beasts are because there's nothing to compare them to out in the ocean. But for a good reference of size, this is what the nacelle looks like for the Haliad X. Because of this size, transporting and installing all of the components is a logistical and engineering challenge. To make it work, the rotors, nacelle, tower, and foundation are all transported via an instant installation vessel to the desired location. Once at the location, the monopiles are forced deep into the ground by the vessel, serving as the foundation. On top of that goes the transition piece, which allows for an interconnection between the monopile and what comes above. The tower is then precisely placed with a crane, followed by the nacelle and the blades. This is a process that takes days at a minimum and is highly dictated by the weather and wind that can alter the precision of the crane. Once this is completed, there's some relatively minor cleanup work and check Cups, then the undersea cable can be ran to the nearest floating substation, where the voltage is stepped up before going to the shore in order to minimize losses. As an interesting fact, this project is one of the first to use HVDC, or high voltage direct current, instead of alternating current. This will theoretically help cut down on the total amount of losses as the electricity is transmissed to the shore. After leaving the substation, the cables run undersea to the locations I previously mentioned, and the project has a total cost of around 12 billion in US dollars, which begs the question, who's in charge? So this is actually a joint venture partnership between SSE Renewables, who owns 40%, Equinor, who owns another 40%, and Vargrun, who owns 20%. SSC Renewables is leading the development and construction, while Equinor will operate and maintain the WIM farm on completion for its expected operational life of around 35 years. And a major milestone was hit in October 2023 when the first turbine at Dogger Bank A was completely installed and started to deliver electricity. As of early February 2024, the project was vastly behind schedule and only had fully set up five turbines. With this being said, it may be a bit too sporty to think that banks A, B, and C will be fully commissioned by the expected 2026. Now, plenty of work has already been done, and most of the monopiles and foundations are already in place, but you would have to imagine for a project like this that hiccups and delays are a constant. 
So all of this sounds great, but is it actually effective? The first question we have to ask is, will this help lower the cost of electricity? After all, if we can't observe any financial benefit, then the project will not be worth it for the average person. I know we're not talking about the US, but from a poll, 43% of Americans would not be willing to pay even $1 more per month on their electricity bill to address climate change. And that number rises dramatically as the dollar amount goes up. By principle, it's easy to believe that offshore wind should lower the cost of electricity. You just set up the turbines and they keep on spinning. Well, no, not really. First, the turbines must be maintained on a regular basis, and naturally, because they're located in the ocean, they're relatively difficult and expensive to constantly get to. There's also downtime, and they actually lose efficiency at a small rate every year, so the early years are going to be your best ones in terms of generation. When considering actual costs, it's helpful to reference a comprehensive chart like this, illustrating the average price of electricity per megawatt hour across different sources. As depicted, numerous cleaner alternatives out shine offshore wind. Naturally, you might question the necessity of offshore wind farms after seeing this data, but I'll address why we actually still need this in the next section. Another question we should ask is, does this really come with a reduction of life cycle emissions? Between producing, transporting, and decommissioning the turbines, there is a significant resource demand, which chances are would cause quite a bit of emissions. While this is true, the life cycle emissions of an offshore wind turbine are significantly less than that of natural gas. Factoring in everything, a study was conducted in 2019, and the results concluded that one megawatt hour of electricity through floating offshore wind power generates around 15 kilograms of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas emissions over its life cycle, meaning that the floating offshore wind produces at least 92% less greenhouse gas emissions per megawatt hour as compared to natural gas. And given that wind turbines used offshore today are considerably more efficient than their 2019 counterparts, you would have to imagine that this percentage has not shrunk at all. The last Last question to ask is, is this really creating jobs? And this is a very fair question. After all, almost every advertisement about green energy mentions the creation of numerous jobs. And I've actually found this to be somewhat untrue. In 60 minutes, went out in the field and found something similar. It seems to create a plethora of jobs during the construction phase, which eventually dwindles down to just maintenance personnel and operators. But on Dogger Bank's website, it said that more than 2,000 UK jobs have been created or supported in relation to the construction and operation activities of Dogger Bank. Many of these are based in the north of England, where the project's supply chain is creating long-term opportunities for people just starting out in their careers, as well as more experienced workers transitioning from other industries to renewable energy. But even with them saying this, we really don't know how many of these are here to stay, and as a whole, it remains to be seen. Now that I got the negatives out of the way, let's talk about the future of not only the Dogger Bank wind farm, but of offshore wind farms across the globe. First, it's important to understand that offshore wind is a valuable portion of a diverse makeup of clean generation sources for a country's grid. As land gets more expensive and regulated, it's definitely important to have the technology and practical ability to generate power in this way. This is why, despite cost, it's an extremely important resource. As mentioned earlier, Dogger Bank's A, B, and C are expected to be completed by 2026. This will also help the UK in another way, by potentially decreasing the amount of power that they import from other countries, which, if you live in the UK, is a big step in the correct direction. Additionally, Dogger Bank D and many other projects have been announced and should initiate in the coming years. Dutch, German, and Danish electrical grid operators are cooperating in a project to build a North Sea wind power hub complex on one or more artificial islands to be constructed on Dogger Bank as a part of the European system for sustainable electricity. The power hub would help interconnect the three national power grids with the future Dogger Bank wind farm. A study commissioned by a Dutch electrical grid operator reported in February 2017 that as much as 110 gigawatts of wind energy capacity could ultimately be developed at the Dogger Bank location. As for the US, regulators have announced an extremely ambitious 30 gigawatt generation goal by 2030 of offshore wind. While I can almost guarantee that this mark will not be achieved in that time, there has been a boom of offshore wind projects announced within the last year. Offshore wind, while containing its share of challenges and a hefty price tag, is a necessary commodity for the future of green energy. It's clean, it's reliable, and it's pretty cool to look at. I make all types of engineering, construction, and technology videos, and I ask that you check more of them out if you have an interest. They take forever to make, so any help you give is much appreciated. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.